Hello friends, my name is Lisa Graustein. I use she, her, her pronouns. And this is the first of three short videos I'm doing as part of the virtual plenary, focusing on the Doctrine of Discovery and our minute repudiating the Doctrine of Discovery. I'm filming this today on Massachusetts land near the Deposit River estuary in what's currently known as the Dorchester neighborhood of Boston. The theme for sessions this summer is provoke one another to love. And this is a line that comes from a letter that Margaret Fell wrote in 1656 to friends where she's quoting Hebrews 10. And at the time she was writing, the way that English speakers understood the word provoke was not the way we use it today, but to mean to call in, invoke, draw out, invite, or petition. And so I offer this video in the spirit of calling us into some of the minutes that we have approved that we have yet to fully live into, to invoke the wisdom and love of God and our capacity to live into those minutes, to draw out our collective knowledge, wisdom, and capacity, and to invite one another to love fully in the way that God calls us to, to bring about the justice the world so desperately needs right now. As I said, this is one of three videos. This first one will be exploring the minute. The second one will be looking at some of the patterns of oppression that come out of that minute as part of our yearly meetings ongoing commitment to um, recognizing those patterns so we can interrupt and transform them. And then the third video in this little series will be some spiritual practices that help us step into the life and spirit of the minute. Before I talk about the minute itself, I wanna invite us to do some embodied listening that often in the busyness of our days, we can get pretty disconnected from our bodies um, and that when we can listen fully with our bodies, we are able to be more present and more creative and listen more clearly to what God has to say to us. So whether you're listening to this as a podcast, watching this as a video, you're by yourself, you're with other people, I invite you wherever you are to straighten your spine a little bit. If you can put your feet flat on the floor, and to just take a deep breath. And as you breathe deeply to really center the divine, to check into your divine center, whatever language or imagery works best for you for that deeper connection, to really feed that connection with your breath. If you want, you can put one hand on your chest and one on your belly, just as a reminder to breathe deeply, expanding your rib cage, expanding your belly, and as you continue to breathe deeply and throughout the course of listening or watching to this, please notice your body. Notice where there is tension, notice where there is ease, notice how your body feels. And particularly as we're talking about the doctrine of discovery, notice how your body is reacting. That so often we just listen intellectually, but our body contains tremendous capacity to understand and process. Similarly, I invite you to notice your feelings. Feelings are never right or wrong, good or bad. They simply are. And they provide us again with tremendous information. And so as you listen to this, what are the feelings that come up for you? What are the, your emotional responses? The third invitation is to notice energy, to notice how energy is moving in your body, to notice where it might be stuck, to notice what your energetic reactions are. Um, particularly if you are engaging with this with other people around, how does the energy shift and move among the group of you? And then the final invitation for this bit of embodied listening is to check in with your knowing. And by that, I don't mean your intellectual knowing, not, oh, I've read that or I heard that on NPR, but the deeper knowing that comes from being grounded in spirit and knowing when we hear a truth that is resonating with us, knowing when uh, something is speaking to our condition in that deep way. So again, take another deep breath. So let's look at the minute. So in 2013, we approved a minute repudiating the Doctrine of Discovery, and this is the first piece of the minute. The Doctrine of Discovery was used to justify Christians' right to dominate, exploit, and claim the lands of non-Christians that they discovered. In the days of European exploration and colonization, governments relied on the Doctrine of Discovery, which has its roots in racism, to commit great harm against Native peoples. This doctrine has justified policies of deception, forced removal, sterilization, enslavement, and genocide. The doctrine has not disappeared or been revoked. It has the force of law globally and serves as a framework of oppression fully intact in U.S. federal Indian law today. In 2012, the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues 
focused on encouraging global repudiation of the doctrine of discovery. And we were one of many Christian churches um, during this time that uh, made formal note of our repudiation of the doctrine of discovery. So before I read the rest of the minute, I want to actually just read a little bit of the text of the doctrine of discovery. I've just pulled out um, a few sentences here. This um, what came from a papal bull written in 1493 by the Pope. And in this, the Pope is basically giving sanction to the royal families of Europe, primarily Spain and Portugal, to Christianize and colonize and claim all the lands in the Western Hemisphere. So this is the Pope writing to these royal families. You have the favor of divine clemency to bring under your sway the said mainlands and islands with their residents and inhabitants and to bring them to the Catholic faith. So the first goal here is to Christianize people who are not Christian and to bring them into the Catholic church. And that's the primary driving force behind the doctrine of discovery. We of our own accord, our own soul large us by the authority of almighty God, which we hold on earth, should any of said islands have been found by your envoys and captains, give grants and assign to you and your heirs and successors forever together with all their dominions, cities, camps, places, and villages, and all rights, jurisdictions, and pretenses, all islands and mainlands found to be found, discovered and to be discovered. And we make a point and depute you and your heirs and successors, lords of them with full and free power, authority and jurisdiction of every kind in order to instruct the aforesaid inhabitants and residents in the Catholic faith and train them in good morals. We trust in him from whom empires and governments and all good things proceed. And so in addition to Christianizing the peoples that um, the Europeans will find, the Pope is also giving them full authority over those people and their lands, not just to this generation, but to all of their subsequent generations. And so this is multi-generational um, support for continued colonization. And at the time when they talk about free power, authority, and jurisdiction, that was every aspect of life, that during this time in Europe, um, nobility had the right to every aspect of their subjects' lives, to their physical bodies, to their labors, to the produce of their labors, to any land that they might claim, um, as well as to any material resources. And so this is not just a call to Christianize the peoples of the Western Hemisphere, but to fully claim their bodies, resources, and land. I'm gonna go back now to the minute that we approved in 2013, repudiating the doctrine of discovery. We, as New England Yearly Meeting, repudiate the doctrine of discovery. We are beginning a journey to consider the moral and spiritual implications of how we benefit from and have been harmed by the doctrine as individuals and in meetings. The workings of this doctrine are invisible to most of us. Our first work is to remove the logs from our eyes so that we may see. We need to learn more, find ways to seek forgiveness, and ask how the spirit might lead us. We have heard powerful testimonies to how these issues have affected our lives. We encourage consultation with indigenous peoples to restore the health of ourselves and our planet. We recognize that this is our work to do. On this path, respectfully traveled in love, our goal is true healing so the light of God can be answered in everyone. Our intention is to walk toward being in right relationship with the whole human family and the planet. And one of the sentences that really leaps out to me in this minute is that um, the sentence about how this is not something many of us understand or that the doctrine is invisible to most of us. And I think this speaks to the fact that our yearly meeting um, is predominantly white and that for many white people, seeing the workings of the doctrine of discovery is not something we were raised to do because the doctrine of discovery is the basis for white supremacy in the United States and the maintenance of white privilege. And that many friends of color and people of color and indigenous communities and indigenous friends know directly the impact of the doctrine of discovery because it was a system of power and domination that has targeted indigenous communities and people of color, um, not just on this continent for centuries. And so what I wanna do is just talk a little bit about how the Doctrine of Discovery has and continues to impact all of us so that that is shared information that all of us have going forward. 
the Doctrine of Discovery set up the colonization of the Western Hemisphere. And colonization looks different depending on who's doing it. And the kind of colonization that happened in what's now the United States and what's now New England is a particular kind of colonization called settler colonialism. And there's sort of two main types of colonialism. And so one is where a colonial power goes to a foreign land, usually through military um, might, gains political and military control of the land, forces some labor, extracts resources, but mostly just uses the colony as a source of raw materials and resources that it brings back to its home nation. Settler colonialism is different in that it still has that aspect of military and political control and resource extraction, but additionally, it means the colonist is coming and taking over the land and staying there. And so there's a much greater level of cultural destruction that happens because it's also cultural imperialism. It's not just an extraction of resources, which is also significant in the damage it does. But settler colonialism has kind of a whole other layer of what's happening. So I want to break that down a little bit. The goal of settler colonialism is first to conquer so that the conquering power, the colonial power, can steal and take the labor and natural resources of the land it's colonizing. And as I said, the colonizers also stay. And in order to maintain power, they have to assimilate the existing people in the land they're colonizing into their culture because settler colonialism needs to destroy all other cultures and power structures in order to maintain its power. And one of the ways that assimilation happens is through assimilation into religion, assimilation into culture, and the actual enslavement of human beings as a way of bringing them into the power structure of the colonial force. And when those systems don't work of assimilation and enslavement, the colonial force will kill people. And that's what we see throughout um, the westward expansion of the United, United States. Settler colonialism needs to dominate every aspect of life and culture or destroy it. And again, we see that immediately happening in New England, right? Quakers, um, we show up in New England in the early, or the mid 1600s, rather around 1661, is I think is when New England Yearly Meeting is formed. And so we were part of that first and second wave of European settlers who came, who displaced the indigenous community, um, killed indigenous people, directly through violence or through disease, and then work to assimilate the remaining indigenous community members into um, what was then British and English culture in the, in the colonial communities. And anything that remained of those indigenous cultures had to get Christianized, had to get Europeanized, had to get moved in to the culture or was pushed out and killed. And that happens over and over and over again throughout settler colonialism. One of the ways that settler colonial, colonialism maintains its extreme domination is that it actively works to break all the natural bonds of family and community. And we see this throughout the United States history and today. So first we see it in um, separating indigenous children from their parents, sending them to boarding schools to be assimilated into white culture, adopting them out into white families to be fully assimilated into white culture. And even up until the 1970s in this country, the government was performing forced sterilizations on indigenous women so they could no longer have children. We see it um, in the ways that chattel slavery uses African and then African American people. So first removing Africans from their home nations and family um, to bring them to the United States and then throughout chattel slavery in the United States, the way that rape is used to control the fertility of um, African women, children being sold off from their families. We see it in the Chinese Exclusion Act that limits the immigration of Chinese men but prohibits the immigration of Chinese women to break up families and prevent Chinese families from forming in the United States. And we see it today, particularly at the border, where migrant families seeking asylum are separated and children and parents are removed from each other. So this happens over and over and over and over again. And one of the other things that's happening throughout this process is that anybody who presents 
as terms that we would now, now say two-spirit or genderqueer or transgender or gender non-conforming, those people have to be eradicated because in the colonial paradigm, there's only male and female. Um, and we see that happening in a myriad of ways as different groups of people migrate and immigrate to this country, as different groups of people are trafficked as labor to this country. And so this destruction of family and community and the natural way that we know people are is destroyed at every level intentionally as a way of a asserting power and maintaining control. And this dominance and control and power um, has to deny what it's doing and has to lie about what it's doing. That part of the, the functioning of settler colonialism is that it be seen not just as the supreme political and military authority, but as the supreme divine authority, as the supreme authority of justice. That it must control every aspect of how people think and understand rightness to be. And so it tells all these lies about it. And we can see that throughout history and concurrently in how different groups of people who are not the white settler colonial structure get talked about. We see it in the language that is used to describe people. We see it in the lies and myths that are used to talk about different communities. And then we see it directly in what we teach our children. So when I was growing up and learning about the westward expansion of our nation, I heard phrases of manifest destiny, of virgin territory, of unclaimed land, um, and none of that was telling the truth of the millions of indigenous people who had been inhabiting that land for millennia, who had to be killed or forcibly removed in order for white settlers to come in and claim that land. Similarly, there's textbooks even today that tell lies about the institution of slavery and instead talk about workers coming from Africa. That was in a textbook published in 2015. And so part of our work to repudiate the doctrine of discovery, part of the first step is just to actually tell the truth so we know what has fully happened so that we can start the work the long generational work of healing. One of the other ways that settler colonialism functions is not as a singular event, but it's a multi-generational process that has multi-generational impact. My first ancestors came to this hemisphere um, in the 1630s and were granted by the colonial powers land. And so my family for, and I'm the 12th generation to, to inhabit and colonize this hemisphere in my family, my family has been part of that settler colonialism process um, for nearly 400 years. And the multi-generational impact that that has had on me is that my family was able to accumulate wealth and maintain a level of uh, material security, access to education and jobs. That means my life is incredibly privileged in this country, that I have inherited multi-generational wealth. I've inherited the benefits of my family being able to access education, political power, and um, physically, I was born into a body that comes from generations of people who have had enough to eat and have generally been able to avoid um, intense trauma through the security they've been able to amass because of their privilege. Other people whose families were not privileged by settler colonialism but were targeted because they were indigenous, because they were um, African because they were Latinx, because they were coming from um, Asia and the Pacific Islands, that multi-generational process has meant an inability to accumulate wealth and security multi-generationally. It has meant a denial of access to jobs, political power, and education, and it has meant that um, people are being born into bodies that carry the epigenetic impact of multi-generational trauma. And so Settler colonialism is not something that happened back then. It has been a continual process in this hemisphere since 1492 that impacts every single one of us who's inhabiting this continent today. And so when we talk about the doctrine of discovery, we're not talking about something in the past. We're talking about an ongoing process that we're a part of. And that Quakers as a, as a whole body have, gen have benefited from it in terms of our ability to access land, our ability to access political power, our ability to maintain our culture and norms as a religious body that also had some race and class privilege throughout this system as a whole body. Obviously, we're a diverse group of friends and different ones among us have had different levels of experience with that. But as a religious society, we've benefited tremendously from the doctrine of discovery and settler colonialism um, here in New England and across the United States. 
And then the final aspect of settler colonialism I want to talk about a little bit is that because it requires such an extreme level of um, violence and dehumanization, the perpetrators of settler colonialism often have to have experienced some version of that violence among themselves in order to do it to others. And so settler colonialism and the Doctrine of Discovery did not just pop up in the 1490s, but they were the result of centuries of um, religious, economic, and sexual oppression throughout Europe and violence. And so when we look at Europe prior to the 1490s, we can see long patterns of the ways that the feudal system controlled people, created strict class boundaries, dehumanized whole groups of people, gave um, men in high positions of authority right to do sexual violence to women and any genderqueer people they encountered, the ways that the church was used to amass wealth and power often to the disadvantage of the poorest groups of people. And I'm saying that not to say that we are all victims of the system and no one has responsibility, but rather that if we're invested in healing, if we're invested in really repudiating what this doctrine has been doing to all of us, we need to look at where it comes from and we need to look at how it's impacted everybody along the way. And we need to look at the different patterns of control and domination that it in acts so that we can interrupt them at every point along the way. That was a fair amount of information in a very short amount of time. And so I want to end this video with some reflection questions. So if you're by yourself, you can consider these. If you're um, engaging with this material in a group, you're invited to turn and, and talk to a few friends. So the first question is, as you listen to this, what did you notice in your body? How are you feeling right now, physically, emotionally, energetically? What came up for you? The second question is, how has the Doctrine of Discovery shaped your family's experience on this hemisphere? So what impact has the Doctrine of Discovery had on your family's journey? The third question, what are some ways that you see the ideas embodied in the Doctrine of Discovery showing up today? I referenced a few, but there are many, many more. And so where and how do you see the Doctrine of Discovery showing up today in our country? That could be in our country, in the Religious Society of Friends, in your home community. And then my final question is, our, our minute repudiating the Doctrine of Discovery ends with, on this path, respectfully traveled in love, our goal is true healing so the light of God can be answered in everyone. Our intention is to walk toward being in right relationship with the whole human family and the planet. How do you hear God calling us to do this healing work? If you click on the links below this video on the YouTube page, it'll take you to a page on the Yearly Meeting website where I put in links to resources that I used in creating this video, links to um, some incredible work that our friends around New England and around the country are doing to repudiate the Doctrine of Discovery, as well as a glossary of some of the terms that I use. Thank you.